Hello, welcome everyone. So LinkedIn is one of my favorite topics to talk about. It actually is Elise's as well. She's also an expert in it. So we might, you know, do a little bantering back and forth. And Elise, please, please, please chime in, right? Anytime you want to kind of enhance this. Um, so actually, before I go into um, this, this, this presentation, um, I actually wanted to start with your questions. Um, so I do this differently. I've, I've been working, doing this for JCA for many years, and sometimes I start with a presentation and sometimes I don't. Today, I've decided I'd like to actually start with your questions because um, I want to make sure that I understand where you're all coming from, what your, what your knowledge is of LinkedIn, the kinds of questions that you have so that I can tailor um, my presentation to, to your needs. And then we'll go, kind of go go from there, okay? So go ahead and just open up open up your mic. And Fiona, I know you already have a question about um, how to identify the hiring manager for the role. So we'll definitely talk about that. Um, who else has questions? And these could be questions at any level because I realize that the folks that are on this call, I mean, some of you have a, a lot of experience. Some of you have very little experience with LinkedIn. In fact, is there anyone here who doesn't have a LinkedIn profile? Could you raise your hand? One person. <laughs> One. Mike, and that's okay. It's actually very normal. Look out if it's all. Mine's very old. Yeah. Okay. So, so either so if you if you have um, either no profile or you have one that's older or you just never use it, it's, maybe it's never it's not filled out very much. Just kind of basic. Raise your hand. So Kate and Michael and Lee, Leah, is it? Okay. So a few of you. Um, so who falls into the? I'll say the second category, which is you feel like you have a, a fairly fleshed out profile. Uh, you've connected with people, you check it out once in a while. You're not really active, active, but eh, kind of fair to middle of who, who, who's in that category. Rachel, Rachel, is that it? Rachel. Rochelle, Rochelle, I apologize. Rochelle and, and Liz. Okay. Okay. Would, are, would the rest of you fall into the category? Yeah, you kind of know a thing or two about a thing or two about LinkedIn and you feel fairly comfortable with it. Would that be the rest of you? Okay, great. So this is a very normal situation with, with this kind of a class. We have some people from every every walk of life here. Um, and because of that, I wanna make sure that we're all very respectful of everybody's learning journey, okay? So, so with that, feel please feel free to ask me questions now. And I realize for those of you who have a very, uh, who either don't have a profile or are not quite uh, using it right now, your questions might seem a little more basic, which is fine. And some of you might ask more advanced questions and that's fine too. So go ahead and just you know open up your mic, whatever question you have is fine. And I'll just make sure that I, I, I address things. Uh, Fiona typed into the chat, do you think it's best to look at uh, other people's LinkedIn profiles anonymous, anonymously? Anonymously, right. Yep. Question? Sure, I have two questions. Um, yep. If you could talk a little bit more about um, following a company on LinkedIn, um, which Elise has referenced as well, you know, in terms of, you know, ins and outs and, you know, um, you know, things to consider when doing that. Okay. Um, and then my second question is um, how to align or, you know, keep um, consistent um, I mean, I know it's so important to keep the re our resume information consistent with what we have on, on LinkedIn. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's but a one of the challenges I think for us and, you know, potentially in this group is, you know, a lot of the advice around resume um, development was to remove dates, um, you know, not necessary, you know, creates a tension around ageism, sure. but LinkedIn is not as flexible as that. Yeah. So how do we align those two um, you know, that question. issue across the two different formats. Great question and, very, and a very, very standard question. So I'm, I'm very prepared for it. Thank you for okay, that. Okay, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm, sure. Okay, yes, Sarah, I have a question. I have a question. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, I do have a LinkedIn profile. I um, um, was that second group that you uh -huh. had asked about, you know, tap into it every so often, you know, check. I want to, I really need to clean it up some more. But my question has to do with, um, let's say your second or third um, tier connections, um, they are at a company that I'm very interested in, but I don't necessarily know them, okay? Because, you know, those connections, they kind of like this virus. They just compound, you know what I'm saying? Sure. So how best do you uh, approach them if, if they're at this particular company yep. that, you, that you're trying to get with? But sure. they're kind of way down in your connection line. Yeah, yeah, that's actually kind of the point of seconds and thirds, right? The assumption is you don't know them, um, and so that, that's it's just a great question around how do you how do you make a meaningful connection? Yeah, perfect. Thank you for that. So folks are typing questions. 
questions into the chat box as okay. well. Do you um, want to share some? Yeah, uh, Kwesi had, uh, do you make your profile generic so that it's not speaking to a particular position? And um, Ellie had, um, what does it mean when you're notified that someone has looked at your profile and can you find out who it was without signing up for a premium? Okay, great questions. Anything else? Sure, I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> I know that LinkedIn will send um, updates um, as one makes an announcement and makes an update to one's profile to one's network on LinkedIn. Um, but to my mind, there's certain updates. Let's say after your training today, we all go in and we make, you know, tweaks to make it stronger. Yep. How do we under, you know, how can we understand that? I mean, those kind of tweaks, nobody needs to get that announcement necessarily. Right, right. And, and just, I'll just, I, I'm not, I know I'm not answering all the questions now, but let me just address that once super mm -hmm. fast. Actually, sure. there are very few things now that LinkedIn actually updates. LinkedIn has gotten some pushback. Okay, this great. question because of a lot of people who are doing have been doing confidential job searches. They used to think, oh, let me just update everybody on everything. Well, not everything. Right. They never they never did everything, but they updated people on more than they do now. Um, and now it is um, at least help me out here. It's like three things. It's if you update your picture, if you change your job, or if you have a work anniversary. I think those are the only three things. At least do, do you remember that? That's what yeah. they did in the last couple of years. It's also a setting in yeah, there's the settings setting. in privacy. Right. You yes. can just click the radio button to know. You can, you can just say, I, I, don't want to, I don't want anybody updated on anything. You can actually click that button and I can show you where that is. But if you did right. want- and Especially if you're making lots of changes. Yeah, just, just know, turn just it off. Yeah. Know while you're doing all the changes and then you can switch back. Right, right, right. Okay. But again, only three things. I think it's picture, job title change, and work anniversary. So for example, if you're updating your about section, which I'm going to highly recommend you do, we'll do a whole training on that. Even if you wanted LinkedIn to update, to update your network, they won't, <laughs> okay? Right, okay. So it's, it's very, very limited now in their scope. Okay, that's really helpful, thanks. Sure, okay. Liz had a question and then Rachelle. Um, I wanted to know if you could uh, talk about LinkedIn Premium, which somebody else just mentioned. I've had a couple people recommend to me that I should do that so I can see who's checking me out. And I just wanted to get your, sure. your take on that. And, sure. um, and I also have the same um, concern that I'm applying for jobs in a bunch of different areas like I can stick with what I've been doing or I can branch out and like I'm not sure like for some like in a resume I wouldn't say I was a lawyer if I was going for a non-lawyer job right but on LinkedIn I have it there and I don't know if there's any conventional wisdom on on how to handle those things so so actually those are two questions so the, the benefits of LinkedIn premium but how would rephrase your, your second question for me because I, I could I could address that in a lot of different ways yeah, I mean, so my, one of my concerns is that when I am sending out a resume to a job, I can absolutely tailor it to highlight yeah, what I think is sure. the most relevant of my experience. Right. Um, and I mean, I don't know that anyone's going to not hire me because I'm a lawyer, but right. um, but I'm not sure if it should be featured prominently. Uh, you know, again, I'm not right. looking for lawyer jobs. Right, right, right. Uh, Got it. Yes. I'll call this sort of the customized versus the generic LinkedIn profile. Exactly. Brand. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, oh yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. Great. All right. Other yeah. I actually have the same question. So about the premium, I just recently purchased it and I wanted to know if it was worth it. But, okay. Yeah. okay. We'll, we'll, we'll address that too. Thanks so much. Anything else? Sally. Yes, I have a question. Um, I find that when I use the LinkedIn, the jobs that uh, sent to me are not uh, location-wise are uh, very um, far out. I couldn't uh, try to narrow it down of the location. Um, and also, um, another thing is uh, I feel that um, there's a um, hundred million things to do when we're getting perfect on our LinkedIn site so people can find us. But what are some uh, basic things that we need to do so we can use the minimum time but get the best effort yeah. out? Mm -hmm. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Is there any publication out there that you recommend for somebody that wants to uh, start with the very basics? of LinkedIn and uh, sort of uh, have a reference guide? That's a great question, actually. At least that, I'm not, since I only do my own trainings, I'm not really I'm hip on, on the publications. Are you, Elise? No, no, I can't yeah. think of anything. 
Although I do know someone who came out with a book recently. Um, I'll check it out on Amazon and see. Um, she, she's a, a I'll, I'll check out her book and see if it's one I would recommend. I know, I know a couple people who just came out with books. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to have an answer for you for that by the end of the session, Laura. Okay. Anything else? Um, I just would like you to address generally career transition and oh, how yeah. that works. I oh, think yeah. we've touched on it, but oh, yeah, some more. yep. I actually have a I have a very good example of that for you. Good. Another question, Sherry. Um, so I get messages about trainings that LinkedIn is offering. Um, are there particular trainings that you highly recommend, and others that you don't? Yes, it's the same as question as before. I'm actually not very familiar with. Okay. Um, I, I don't keep up to date on the trainings that the LinkedIn does. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Anything else? Okay, great. So here, here's what we're going to do. Um, so first of all, I'm going to actually start. I'm going to open up a, a, a deck. And if this is a, um, what I call a, oh, sorry. Is this another question from Phil? When everyone, when does everyone see when I have, when does everyone see when I have a conversation or respond back to somebody directly? When are conversations from one person to another? Um, so real quickly, so when you're talking about um, what's, what LinkedIn calls messaging, that's when you have a first level contact, meaning somebody you're directly connected to and you're messaging back and forth, which would have been email, right? But in LinkedIn, they call it messaging. It is private. Nobody ever sees what you communicate to another person, like ever. That's not, I mean, LinkedIn like, in Seattle, but hopefully they're not checking that. But no, no one, no one sees your conversations. Okay. All right, so with that, um, what I'd like to do is open up with sort of a broad presentation very quickly around how to sort of think about LinkedIn from a 100,000 foot perspective relative to your job search, okay? So here we go. And then we'll, then we'll jump into all of, your, all of your questions. All right, so, so here we go, right? Two ways to land a job. You can submit your resume. You can show up before your resume. Now, I realized when I, when I came in earlier, Elise was actually starting to allude to that. There is, um, Elise was talking about, you know, kind of making sure that there are people, that people who know you, like you, and trust you are the ones who are getting you into that employer. And that is, uh, that cannot be overemphasized in your search. You know, it used to be back in a day, you know, and we, we, all of us are old enough to remember pre-internet, pre-online submissions, pre any of that stuff. When we were trained to do job search, we were trained to submit your resume, right? That's what you do. You submit your resume to a job posting and that's all that there is. And now it is all about the hidden network. 80% of all jobs are hidden from the public sphere. They are not, the jobs are not gonna be found on LinkedIn's job board or Indeed or Career Builder or any, or any trade publication. It absolutely is being done by networking. And because of that, your networking, and LinkedIn is one of the many ways you can do it, but your LinkedIn networking has got to be stellar because you need to show up in such a way that when that employer, that employer is doing that search, that you are top of mind to somebody. By the way, I'm getting a little feedback and I'm not sure if it might be because um, other folks are, um, are could actually, could, could everyone mute? That would be fantastic. Maybe that'll uh, cut down on the feedback. Thanks so much. Um, in, in any event, so so you've got this hidden network. You've got you've got employers who are constantly tapping their network and saying, hey, Johnny, hey, Sally, do you know of anybody who can do X, Y, and Z? When you have a strong enough network where people think that you are top of mind, what'll happen is, when that employer contacts Johnny about the director of such and such that Johnny is hiring for, and it's not right for that person, they're gonna say, hey, call Amy. Hey, call Leah. Hey, call Kate, okay? So this is incredibly important. I wanted to frame that for you because there's, there's a huge ecosystem in LinkedIn that you need to be thinking about. And here are some of the kind of the top end categories. Number one, it's important to have a searchable brand. Searchable brand means that there are two kinds of, of, of people who are looking for you, the employers and also your network. Meaning employers are using LinkedIn to search for you, whether that's a corporate recruiter, meaning somebody internal who's a recruiter, who's kind of you know, searching around all the time. It could be a hiring manager potentially, who if they know how to use LinkedIn, they might be doing that. But your network is doing it too. Again, as I just mentioned, if somebody is doing a search and they tap of somebody in your network, your network is gonna be looking for you too, or they might help that person out and do some searching. So you've gotta have the right keywords and the right brand 
on your LinkedIn profile to get noticed. Okay. Second thing is you can use it for proactive networking. And when I say proactive networking, this is not about specifically tailoring it for a particular job. So it's one thing when you hear about an opportunity, you know, you have that job posting and you want to get noticed. We'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But the proactive networking has more to do, and I think it was, I forget who was who asked the question around how do you leverage your second levels, your thirds, and all of this. There are a lot of ways that you can you can proactively network on LinkedIn, and I'll just give you a, a very quick example. So let's say um, somebody on this call is a marketing professional. Let's say you are a director level in, in, in marketing, digital marketing, let's say, and you want to go build a community. Well, one of the things that you can do is go find your peers. Now, you think to yourself, why in the world would I be tapping my peers? Aren't they my competitors? Actually, no, quite the opposite. Those are the very people who, when a recruiter taps them and they say, hey, do you know anybody who's a, a, a good, you know, solid director of digital marketing? They say, not me, but I know someone who is. Because it's all at a collegial level. Whenever recruiters are trying to tap people, they're trying to see, they're, they're, certainly they're trying to tap the person that they're recruiting, but they're hoping that if it's not right for them, that somebody within their peer network is going to be the right fit. Because typically, what, who do we hang out with? People who are like us, people who are at the same level. So if you can go ahead and proactively network with the people who are your peers, the people who do what you do, you are much more likely to be thought of when that opportunity comes up that's not right for them, but it's right for you. That's just one example. The other thing is getting referred. And this is what we call getting an internal champion. So an internal champion, and at least I think alluded to that, is where you're looking at an opportunity, and you say, okay, the, the position, I, I usually use the American Red Cross, so don't ask me why, but I've been using them as an example for a long time because they're, they're local and, and they're large. Um, so let's say you're applying for the, again, director of marketing position at the Red Cross, and you notice that you have a, that the hiring manager, or even the HR person, but let's say the hiring manager is your second level contact. And so for those who are not as proficient with LinkedIn, let me just back up a step and explain what I mean by these levels, these connections. So a first level connection is somebody you are directly connected with, right? So let's say I'm connected, and I am, I'm connected to Elise, okay? Elise is connected to Amy. Amy is not connected to me, but she's connected to Elise. So Elise is the person that's in the middle. So I am first levels to, to a first level connection to Elise. I am a second level connection to Amy, okay? Now, let's say Amy is connected to Kate. So Kate's my third level. So if you can kind of go down the, down the aisle. In LinkedIn, LinkedIn will only tell you who is the first level connection, what they call a mutual connection, a shared connection between you and your second level. You're not going to know who's in, in between your third level, you and your third level, but you will always know who is between you and your second level. And that's a fantastic way to leverage that context. So to create that internal champion. So in this particular case, uh, Amy is the hiring manager for the, you know, she's the chief marketing officer at the Red Cross, okay? So she's hiring for the, for the director who's going to be a direct report. And I notice on LinkedIn, and I'll show you in a minute how to, how to find that. Um, so I notice that Elise is connected to Amy. And I want Amy to pull me out of that pile. I want Amy to pull me out of the, the, the cyber hole that is what's called the applicant tracking system, the ATS, which is probably what the uh, American Red Cross uses to, to, to aggregate their resumes in this big database. And there's thousands of resumes in there. So I want Amy, the chief off marketing officer, to lift me out. So I reach out to, I find, I find that Elise is my first level contact. So I reach out to Elise and I, I'm actually, a, a little tip here, by the way, is if you're actually doing that outreach, do it via email, not through LinkedIn. I'll, and I'll, I'll show you the technology of that in a second as to why, but, but, but the bottom line is that a lot of people don't check their LinkedIn, okay? So in fact, you might not yourself, right? <laughs> Maybe you are now because you're a job seeker, but a lot of people don't. So if I knew, and if, if, if I didn't know that Elise is as active on LinkedIn as I know she is, I would write her offline and I'd say, hi, Elise, hope all's well. I noticed on LinkedIn that you're connected to Amy. Amy's the chief marketing officer for the American Red Cross. I recently applied for that role attached is my resume and cover letter. Would you consider forwarding my resume and cover letter to Amy for, here's the phrase, for extra consideration, for extra consideration. Now, I didn't ask Elise to recommend me, unless I, I could have if, I, if Elise knew my work. That, that's the one rare exception, but most of the people on, on LinkedIn are not gonna know your work. And so you would simply say, could you refer me for extra consideration? What that does is it prompts, um, it prompts Amy Okay, excuse me, it, prom it prompts Elise to then forward everything to Amy so that Amy can then go to the HR person or the recruiter and say, hey, tap, tap, 
I know uh, my, a colleague of mine told me that there's this really good candidate in there, or at least there's a candidate that I should be considering. Would you airlift that person now for extra consideration? Okay, so it's a, it's a fantastic way to get yourself noticed. I could give you, I, if we had all day, I wouldn't be able to give you enough stories of successful results that I have seen personally. I have seen it through my clients. I have seen your colleagues do. It is an incredibly important tool to get yourself noticed out of the pack of candidates who are your competitors, okay? And then lastly, I just wanna mention, you can build your reputation. Um, this is gonna partially allude to some of the questions we had around what kind of profile should you have? What kind of brand should you have? You know, you mentioned, uh, some people mentioned, um, you know, this idea that you gotta customize your resume, but what do you put on your LinkedIn profile, all that. Your reputation starts with the brand that you create on LinkedIn, but also it can extend from there. You can actually become a thought leader on LinkedIn. If you have, been in the workforce for any length of time, which all of us have, and if you have built any sort of skill set or industry expertise, LinkedIn is a ter terrific way to showcase that through blog posts, through sh uh, sharing other people's information, um, you know, following other people on LinkedIn, making sure that you're part of the community. And by the way, if you are career shifting, this is even more important for you to do because if you're career shifting, you need to be, be, be you need to show up in another community. Because if you're not in that community right now, no one knows you. No one has any idea that you exist. Like for example, I, in my recruiting world, um, I tend to be, I tend to play with uh, association executives. I'm not sure if there's any association professionals on this call. So usually there's one or two. Um, if you are, you can chat me <laughs> later. But but that's a particular community. It's a particular sector, and they have particular challenges. And I I've, I've been playing with those folks for 25 years. They know me. I know them. I know what keeps them up at night. I don't play very much with the government contracting sector, with the healthcare sector, with the technology services sector. I'm, I do not show up in that community per se, per se. I have some contacts, but I don't really show up there. But if I were a job seeker and I were trying to shift into a different sector, I'd have to show up there somehow. And I would do it through networking and I would do it through thought leadership. And I would make sure that people start to understand I'm actually now part of your world. I'm a new family member and I'm figuring out what keeps you guys up at night. And I'm, I'm trying to immerse myself into your world to figure out the urgent challenges that keep you up at night. And I will tell you that in recent years, the career sector that I have seen more and more people want to go into who haven't been in it yet is the environmental sector, as you might imagine, right? With climate change being such a big topic these days, I see people of every stage of life, every walk of life, every business sector say, I want to raise my hand. I want to get into the environment. How do I do it? And I've, and I've worked with people on doing that. And, and again, you need to make sure that you're immersing, you're immersing yourself in that community. So I just want to really quickly talk about crafting a searchable brand. There's three sort of areas. So the first thing is this, this concept of community that I just mentioned. And I define a community as the industry, mission, or sector that you might be connected to. Now, why, why, why do I say might? Not all of you are. And that's fine. That's fine. Some of you are what I'll call cross-community. Right? So you have a profession and you've done it in the nonprofit sector, you've done it in the for-profit sector, you've done it in very, and that's fine, fine, fine. A lot of times there are professions that are uh, very common to kind of cross community, like, you know, HR people, accountants, marketing people. Uh, so those kinds of folks oftentimes are cross community. Um, but some of you are very community folk. You know, like I said, associations, otherwise, others of you are like, yep, yeah, that's me. I'm a healthcare person, higher education, legal, whatever, you know your community. And if you do, and if you wanna stay in that community, it is incredibly important that your brand be focused on the urgent problems that you can solve and want to solve for that community. And I'll show you in your about section how you can do that. Secondly is showcasing what I call your lane. So your lane is your occupation your, or your profession. Think of the difference between community and lane as the community is who you serve and the lane is how you serve who you serve versus how you serve. It's a very important distinction because most of us don't actually think of it that way. Most people think, well, I'm a career professional and I do X. Well, actually not quite. You do X, but it might be that you do X for Y community. And when you can think of it that way, especially for those of you who are career changers, but even if you're not, it'll help to strengthen your brand because what you're basically saying to the world is, particularly if you do have a community, here are the urgent problems that I solve for that community and here's how I do it. Here's who I do it for. Here's how I do it. The reason why that's important is because you have got to walk a mile in the employer's shoes. In fact, I'm, I'm sure many of you on this call have been hiring managers. So I would ask you to put that hat on right now. Remember the last time you ever tried to hire somebody. What were you looking for? Ideally, you were looking for someone who can do the job. Check one. That's the lane. Can you do it? 
got skill set, competencies, what have you. But number two, likely than not, you said to yourself, I really would like somebody who understands our sector, who understands our members, our clients, our customers, our stakeholders, the, the economic environment that we're in. For example, if you're in higher education, that's a very, very different community than the healthcare sector. Now, we all know that intellectually, but if you're a higher ed person, you're trying to like bounce into healthcare, it's a bit of a challenge, right? Because the employer is trying to minimize their risk in the hire. So they're saying, well, why you, why now? Well, there are ways to make the shift, but understand that there's a difference between who you serve and how. And then finally, you want to make sure that you're writing a very compelling headline and about section in your LinkedIn profile. The headline comes right underneath your name. So you've got your name, right? And right underneath it, you've got a bunch of characters. I still to this day have to, to this day, I have to figure out how many characters you have. It's not that much, but it's more than you think. Where you're saying something meaningful, dare I say aspirational, to let the world know this is the, my brand. This is who I serve. This is how I serve. So for example, um, so let's say you're in, a, in the nonprofit you know, community, right? Well, anybody who's in the nonprofit community knows that that's a very, very generic concept. There are lots of different kinds of nonprofits, 501c3s and 501c6s and charity, all these different think tanks or all these different groups. Well, you have to be pretty specific in terms of what is the community that, you are, that you're all about if you have one especially if you're aspiring to be in one. Because if you are aspiring, you can actually say that, aspiring environmental leader. You can, you can mention the kind of um, lane that you have, the kind of skill sets that you have, but you wanna make sure that your community is also connected to it. And again, I'm gonna show you examples of all these things, but I need you to be thinking in terms of your brand because your brand needs to be what I call, um, <laughs> it's, it's sort of this uh, broadly narrow thing. Like what in the world does that mean? Broadly narrow. It has to have some definition to it so that people know you're not just looking for any job. You've got some definition, but it has to have a little bit of breath, a little elasticity so that people have, so you have some flexibility within it. So you don't necessarily have to get too, too, too specific, but it definitely needs to be something that when somebody looks at your profile in a nanosecond, they say, ah, I got it. She is focused on this kind of uh, career, and she's also focused in this kind of, kind of community, presuming that you have one. And the last thing I wanted to share before we get into the, into the, into the training is one of the benefits, right, um, of, of how and why to network. So it, is, it really is about finding the people in, in both your community and your lane. And there are different ways to do this. So first of all, you can rekindle relationships. What do I mean by that? Every one of us has what we would call, in, in networking terms, we would call this dormant relationships. People we have met in the past, we've had a good relationship with in the past. It could be five years ago. It could be 10 years ago. It could be 25 years ago. But I don't know if you're like me. You know what it's like. You, you, you reconnect with, I've done this even recently. You reconnect with somebody out of the blue. You haven't talked to them in 20 years. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, Sally, how's it going? Oh, my. And it's like, it's like not a day has passed, right? Because you, you left on it with a good feeling with that person. So you can rekindle those old relationships. And I definitely recommend that you should because you already have somebody in your network who trusts you. They don't have to be recent for you to rekindle it. In fact, that's the whole point of rekindling, right? Is to bring them back into your network, catch them up. You catch up with them, they catch up with you. You're, 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 you're building a relationship such that they're like, oh, wow, Amy, it's been amazing. It's been so long. What, what are you up to now? How can I help you? And you find out how you can help them. It's a hugely important thing to do. Number two, you can research employers. This is not a light thing. Um, researching employers can be, can be done for a lot of different reasons. So for example, um, it could be on the proactive side of things, you decide you are either career shifting or even if you're not, you're, you're simply going after a new opportunity and you're, try, and you're figuring out what types of employers should I be going after? So one of the things you can do, and again, I'll show you on the, on the tactical side when we get into, into, into the hands-on training piece. Um, so, so for example, let's say, um, you are going, going back to that director of marketing. You're looking for your peers, okay? Now, you're not just going to be looking for your peers for the purpose of making that kind of, you know, collegial connection. It's for that purpose too, but here's a second, a hidden reason as to why you want to do that. If you start looking for your peers in director of digital marketing, you start doing a, a search for those people. As you pull up their profiles, here's what you're going to see. You're going to see where they've been a director of marketing in this job and that job and that job. Guess what? because they've been a director of marketing in these positions, that, what does that mean? That means that those employers hire directors of marketing, okay? They hire the very kind of position that you're looking for. 
And that could be a hidden market for you of, of organizations that never would have <clears throat> that never would have shown up on your radar. They're not posting a job right now. Maybe they have a hidden opportunity that you're not aware of. But because you have figured out that's, that there's a director of marketing there or there has been in the past, there is a good, <clears throat> good likelihood that that could be a prospective employer for you. But that's, again, you're researching employers. <clears throat> of course, you can research employers if there is a job opportunity, a job posting that you've seen. The first thing that you want to do is pop that employer's name in the search bar. Again, we're gonna, I'll show you the tactics of this in a minute. <clears throat> you're going to pop that name in the search bar. You're going to hit enter, and you're going to hit the people button, and all the people, the employees who currently work there, are going to show up. And what happens there, oh my gosh, the, 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 the possibilities are endless in terms of what you can do there. You can be looking for potential hiring managers, even if there's not a current job, but especially if there is. You can look for current hiring managers. You can look for who's in HR. You could actually start to do a little bit of organizational mapping. If you start to see, wait, like for example, when we pull up the Red Cross, you're gonna see with marketing, because I've done this search a lot, there's a lot of different kinds of marketing people who do all kinds of different things. And it's fascinating. You could actually just start to plot, plot it out and figure out who does what and, 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 and who, who works for whom and you know, all of this. Really interesting. It can give you a bit of a, of a high level overview as to what's going on with that employer so that when you're trying to build relationships so when you're trying to get noticed for this role, all of a sudden you have a better understanding of who does what and, and, and what their roles are. You could explore a new career. And I'm gonna give you an example um, coming up soon as to, to uh, you know, a live example of this. But this goes back to all the rest of the things that we just talked about. If you're exploring a new career, either in a new community or in a new lane, and may I, may I suggest to you that it's, it's easier to shift to one or the other, but not both, meaning, Employers are trying to mitigate their risk in hire. They just are. That's just that's their job. Your job is to pursue your career goals. Their job is to pursue their organizational goals, and their job is to minimize the risk. So, because of that, and they have very little time to train, they want to make sure that you can hit the ground running, okay, or at least walking really quickly, okay. So, if you're trying to shift your lane and your try and your your community is a little bit more challenging because then you're you're much more of an untested, um, uh, you know, quantity. But if you're switching one or the other, what you can do is you can explore the other. So in fact, I'll just share this example right now and then I'll show you, I'll share the, uh, the, the, the profile in, in a little bit. So there's a gentleman named Steve Poharillis. He's actually a former JCA person. He was sitting in your seat years ago when I was doing one of these trainings. He ended up working with me. I mentioned I'm a career coach. I write resumes and I write LinkedIn profiles and I help people figure out their trajectory. Anyway, he came to me and he said, uh, you know, he says, sure. He says, I'm, I've been a mortgage banker for 25 years. And I want to get out of Dodge, right? And I understood it wasn't a good, not a good field for him at that time. And so he says, "But I don't, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up." Now, mind you, the guy is like, you know, pretty seasoned, right? But he 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 shared with me that classic question. What we figured out together is that his real passion is something that's called that I had no, I never knew what this was before. Something called regenerative medicine. Now, for those of you who don't know, and I didn't know, it's basically stem cell therapy on yourself. So, the, so if you have an orthopedic issue, like back ish, issue, knees, whatever, this is a very expensive procedure, but these, these regenerative medicine practitioners will pull your own stem cell and you know, help you heal. Okay, fine. So he's explaining this to me. And I'm like, now think to yourself, how are we going to get a mortgage maker to get into regenerative medicine? I mean, talk about 180 degrees. Well, here's how we did it. So remember I said there's a difference between your community and your lane? What we realized is that Steve wasn't just a mortgage banker. His real lane was not mortgage, ba mortgage banking. His real lane was sales. Mortgage bankers are salespeople, okay? So what we said was, how about if we help you promote yourself to regenerative medicine medical practices so you can sell on their behalf and recruit patients? Recruit patients. Novel idea. Like, they'd not, who would have thought of that? So he went the extra mile. He went to regenerative medicine conferences and he networked with this, that, and the, we together crafted a, a little sales pitch of how he would pitch himself. To, we created a LinkedIn profile. That was a huge piece. And that's one of the things I'll show you in a, in a, in a bit. And he got it. He, he got the job. Like he got a job selling, recruiting patients for regenerative medicine medical practice. Now it didn't work out for him having nothing to do with the brand. It just, he just decided he didn't like the environment, but, but he, he got the job because we were incredibly intentional about how we made the shift. We kept his sales lane and we shifted him into a new community. Okay, so it's very possible. 
I mentioned this other thing before, getting referred for a job through an internal champion. I've already addressed that. And then another thing is preparing for an interview, not to be under, un, un, understated. If you actually have an interview that you have landed, you better be digging and combing through LinkedIn, looking at that employer, doing all the things I just mentioned, right? Looking at the at who's in that department, who reports to whom. Hopefully some of these folks have a, a, a descriptive LinkedIn profile, a, a descriptions underneath their jobs. You can kind of piece together who's doing what. You could you could potentially, some, some, some will do this and some won't, but some will actually allow you to contact them to see if you can do some, some prep work before the interview. And especially, especially, if, you're, if you have a first level contact, so let's go back to the Elise Amy uh, connection here. So Elise and I are friends, okay? So we have a trusted relationship. So if I were applying to a job that, that was gonna be with Amy and I saw that Elise per se, like we're Jody, for example, right? Jody and I and Elise, right? We're all friendly. Um, meaning they're not just acquaintances. That's, that's the point here. They're not just a, a random connection. Like we trust each other. So I would feel very comfortable going to Elise and saying, hey, Elise, I've got an interview lined up with the American Red Cross and it's reporting to Amy, who's your contact. Um, or it actually, should, I should back up a second. It's gonna be a little harder to do this with Amy, who's the hiring manager. Let's, let's shift it for a second. So I'm gonna take Leah, okay? So Leah also works at the Red Cross. Leah's not the hiring manager. Leah uh, works in that department. Or maybe she works somewhere else, but she's not the hiring manager, okay? Because you can't get an informational interview with a hiring manager that you're gonna be interviewing with. So it's gotta be somebody else. So, so Elise is connected to Leah and I say, hey, Elise, I'm about to have this interview. Leah works there. She's in a different department or she's in the department. I'd like to um, see if you wouldn't mind connecting me to her for the purpose of, of an informational interview so that I can prep, right? I want to understand the culture. I want to understand some of the business challenges. Maybe Leah would be open to speaking with me before I talk to Amy so that I can get a better lay of the land. But because I'm connected to, I'm friendly with Elise, more than likely she's going to say, hey, Leah, you know. She's going to write her and say, would, would you mind, would you do me a favor, right? And have a, a 10 minute conversation with Shira to explain to her the situation. Okay. So that's, that's kind of a high level overview. So what I want to do now is I want to go into the training itself. Okay. So we've given you a lot of backstory and, um, and so actually funny enough, this is, uh, the, 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 um, the profile that's coming up for me right now that I've already prepared for is Steve. Okay. So since we just talked about Steve, I'm just going to jump in there real quickly and share with you Steve's profile. And I'm going to share this profile with you for, for on, on different levels. So, for example, um, see, see, see where I mentioned the headline earlier? Okay. So here was Steve. And Steve, what we decided to do was, oops, what we decided to do was brand him aspirationally. So we called him a regenerative medicine brand ambassador, colon, and then a little tagline, promoting alternative therapies that help orthopedic injuries heal faster. Interesting, right? It was very specific. It's very clear. And it says, it, it speaks to the community that he wants to serve and it says the, the, the problem that he wants to solve. But just as important is this about section. Now, before I, I, I sh I'm gonna read this to you in a minute. But before I do, I wanna share with you um, what the importance of an about section, how most people do it and how I believe you really should do it. So the about section, uh, some of you might, who've been on LinkedIn for a long time uh, might have known this, it used to be called the summary section. Okay. It's changed names. Now it's called about, I think the reason why the LinkedIn did this, uh, made the name change is because back in the day when it was called summary, I think what people, um, inadvertently translated this to mean is just a, almost like the summary on a resume, which by the way is, is passe. Now you don't want to do that, but it used to be, you'd have a summary on your resume, just like an objective statement or like a summary of just kind of your overarching you know, kind of years of experience and skills and whatever. And I think people misinterpreted what they meant by that. What LinkedIn really meant by that is what they would call a passion statement. In fact, they used to have that as the prompt. Many years ago, you would, you would start this box and it, in, in, in gray letters, it would prompt you and it would say, want you to write, I am passionate about dot, dot, dot. Now people didn't really pick up on it. I picked up on it, a lot of people didn't pick up on it. And as a result, we had these very, and to this day, a lot of people's uh, about sections are kind of boring and vanilla. It doesn't really say much, right? But it can say something. It can say something very powerful and very compelling. And my recommendation for all of you is when you're writing your about section, I'm, again, I'm going to give you some examples. When you're writing your about section, you want to write it in a way that says the following. What are the urgent problems that I solve in my career, either for a particular community, meaning an industry, mission, or sector, or just within my lane? So sure, if you're, if you're solving challenges in higher ed or associations or whatever, speak to that. 
And if you're not a community-driven person, it could be here are the urgent problems I solve as a PR professional within the PR industry, or within the um, you know financial analysis industry or project management. Uh, sorry, not industry. Yes, um, lane. You know, in your career, these are the challenges that that are facing project managers or financial analysts or accountants or what have you. These are the problems I solve. So that's number one. Number two, what is your leadership philosophy? Now, when I say leadership, I don't mean you don't have to be a vice president to be a leader. I feel like we're all leaders in our own right. But 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 in your leadership, what's your approach? to solving these problems? What's your secret sauce? What's your how, okay? So first is what are the urgent problems? Number two would be what's your how? How do you do this in a unique way that really adds value to potential employers? Number three, I would recommend that you talk about specific skill sets. Now, when I say skill sets, I'm talking in this case about hard skills before we talk about soft skills. Hard skills are your functional skills. Those are the things you do. Soft skills are how you do them. You're, some people call them behavioral skills. So when I say um, hard skills, functional skills, I would be talking about again, random examples. Again, project management, right? Strategic planning, uh, customer relations, um, uh, you know, budget management, uh, or things that are even very specific to your 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 lane. You know, data analysis or whatever, whatever it is. Maybe a half a dozen of those things. List out your skills, but I would also recommend that you list out the specific ways that you, um, your philosophy almost, like your approach. I'll just give you a very quick example. So uh, I mentioned, you know, you've already heard, I'm, I have at least a couple, I have, I have my own business. I have, a, I have multiple lanes, okay, bottom line. But two of the lanes you've already heard of, I'm a recruiter and a coach. Okay, so in my recruiter hat, one of my hard skills, my functional skills is interviewing. So if I were, in fact, I, I did in my, in my profile, I mentioned interviewing. Um, if I were talking about interviewing and my secret sauce, my secret sauce is, or my philosophy is that I believe that in interviewing, I should be focused as much on a candidate's career motivators as I should be on their, on their skill set. And that's actually, unfortunately, a very unique thing for most recruiters. Most recruiters just want to know, can you do the job, but don't necessarily ask you what your career goals are. So that's my secret sauce. And I, and I have that on my profile. And so you want to think of it just like that. What's your point of view? And then the last section I would recommend um, ha would have to do with your soft skills, your behavioral skills. So it would be kind of the equivalent of I'm known as the girl who, I'm known as the guy who, right? So what do people know you for? What are you, um, what do you, what are you admired for? What are you appreciated for? Being, who are you appreciated for being in your, in your role? So, so with that, with that as backdrop, I'm going to share with you um, Steve's, um, Steve's profile. Now I have to give a cap and give a caveat, first of all, across the board, the profiles I'm about to show you, I wrote, okay, so I'm a copywriter. It's just what I do. Um, so just so you know that, and, and, and then I'm sharing these with you to inspire you to, to, you know, to kind of write something that's a little bit more compelling than maybe what you have, but I want to give you some options. Now, this particular about section is a little bit, um, has, has more uh, longer paragraphs than what I would normally recommend. I normally recommend kind of short and pithy. In this particular case, we needed to tell his story in a way that made sense. So it was actual story. Okay. So here we go. This is what I wrote for Steve. I know what it's like to live with debilitating pain and have great empathy for those who do. During my recovery from a severe back injury, I realized that traditional treatments can take years to provide relief. Though I eventually recuperated, I wish I knew then of an easier path to help me heal faster. Thankfully, I discovered that regenerative procedures such as ABCD medical terms um, off, offer, offer people the opportunity to shorten their rehabilitation period by using their own body tissue to help injuries heal naturally. The benefit of regenerative therapies are cumulative so they have a better chance to avoid surgery. Now my passion is to let the world know it's possible to live a pain-free life. So this is his passion statement, okay? And then in big, bold letters, and by the way, any of you who are career shifting, please consider using this phrase. Why am I making this career shift? Bold, in, in caps. By the way, uh, in LinkedIn, you can't do bolding or underscoring or, um, or, or italics, but you can use capitals, <laughs> capitalization, so use it. And here's the quick story. When I was in the mortgage business, I helped my clients realize their dream of home ownership. When I, while I enjoyed this vocation for 25 years, now my desire is to help people make, realize a new dream, the possibility of faster healing. Most doctors who provide these treatments could benefit from having a boots on the ground brand ambassador. See, he's selling, he's making a pitch to those, those, those doctors. They could benefit from having a boots on the ground brand ambassador to educate people about their life-changing therapies. 
I believe that as doctors continue to see positive patient outcomes, insurance companies will begin to recognize the benefit of making these procedures more affordable. I look forward to the day when everyone can have access to these alternative forms of pain relief. Okay, so he talked about his passion. We talked about making the shift. He now he's pitching and now almost like a reverse pyramid. Okay, we went broad, now narrow. Now we're talking about his lane, about my sales approach. I relate to people of professionalism, honesty, and integrity. I place clients' needs above my personal gain. I listen more than I speak, so forth and so on. And then the call to action, connect with me if, number one, your medical practice could benefit from someone to promote the good work you're doing, or number two, you're living with orthopedic pain and want to be referred to someone who can help, you can reach me at gmail.com, okay? So that is, a, that is an example of a thoughtfully, thoughtfully written LinkedIn profile that speaks very specifically to somebody's um, career shift. Um, I do want to make, I want to mention um, another one here, but this is going to be more of a, um, of a lane, um, not a, not a tribal thing, or excuse me, not tribal, not a, not a community um, based um, uh, profile, but, but a, a, a lane, <clears throat> meaning this is a person who is an operations professional. Okay. Can you all see that Ramsey? Hopefully you can see that. Okay. <clears throat> so you can see here in the headline, outcomes driven operations executive okay so it's very clear he's an operations professional and then we have a few different uh, monikers here he's a business strategist he's a process re-engineer he's a fiscal steward so this kind of sets him apart maybe from other operations leaders by by using a few a few a few common descriptors so for this one um this is a little, a little bit more kind of you know short and quippy and so this is what i wrote for for ramsey I create order out of operational chaos. So if you can figure out a way to, in a quippy kind of a way, to let people know what your superpower is, this would be the place to do it, kind of a mic drop like statement. I create order out of operational chaos. And this is, by the way, this is the, the urgent problem here is not about, there's no community. He's not, he's not focused there. He's just focused on his lane. So we're going to talk about that urgent problem. As organizations continue to disrupt and evolve, infrastructures need to adapt with intention. I re-engineer processes with the end in mind, creating stable yet flexible operational models that can weather the inevitable storms of change. So that's his value prop. My battle-tested consulting career has given me a macro perspective to view intractable problems with objectivity and authenticity. With proven methodologies gleaned from both public and private sectors, I've been valued as a trusted advisor to clarify murky team dynamics with a non-political laser-focused lens. And here we have a little bit of his thought leadership. The change leadership questions I ask, what's the real problem we're trying to solve? What's the underlying cause of that problem? What's the risk of not solving it? And so forth. And then the skills, remember the hard skills. So here we have several. And now these are the, actually, if you looked at these skills, I would imagine that a lot of you probably have the same skill set. But there's two things about this. Number one, these are Ramsey's skills. These are the ones that he wanted to highlight, number one. And number two, remember here, they have this sort of point of view. So strategic planning. In his, in, in his, in his value prop, it's <clears throat> analyzing existing business practices to establish new outputs and outcomes efficiently, creative ideation, changing the perspective on a problem to arrive at an inspired stakeholder-driven solution, and so forth. And then his leadership style, meaning kind of his behavioral skills, I encourage diverse and innovative thinking. I build teams through collaboration and trust. I open <clears throat> power open and transparent communication and so forth, okay? So you can see this is a very clean, compelling statement that says the urgent problems he's solving, how he solves it, and, and draws people in, okay? Now, while I'm here, um, I wanted to share with you, um, actually, let me do it. Uh, let's see if I want to do it this way. Give me, give me one second. So I've got other ones that I was going to pull up. Um, one quick sec. Okay, so I don't have I don't have the right ones here, but but what I do want to do is I want to go down to your experience section. I'm gonna I'm gonna start answering some of the questions that folks were asking me. This is a good place to do it. So this is another individual. Um, her name is um, Elizabeth Moses, and she's actually a tribal person. So if you want to look her up, you'll see another example of that about section. I'm not going to read it to you. But I do want to kind of jump down to the experience. So I want to mention this because somebody um, asked a very good question about what's the difference between, you know, you, you customize your resume, but then you've got this generic LinkedIn. What's that, what's that all about? It's a great question, actually. And I'm not going to give you a panacea answer, but I am going to give you some ways to think about it. <clears throat> First things first, <clears throat> when you're thinking about that LinkedIn brand, which I mentioned should be sort of this broadly narrow thing, you've got to be really, really intentional about how you craft that. I'm saying that because it is for the very, it's for the very, the, the reason of that question 
is it, that's actually why you need to be so intentional. Because when, when people are looking at you on LinkedIn, they need to see an overarching brand. Who do you serve? How do you serve? Why do you serve? What's going on with you? And especially if you're doing that career shift, or I forget who it was who mentioned um, that she's a lawyer and right doesn't necessarily want to highlight that. If you are a lawyer and you don't want that to, to be highlighted, that should that that legal focus should not be in your headline and should not be in your about section. Okay, if if you're trying to really step away from it, it might it'll have to be somewhere in your experience section. You can't help that that's just your your resume showing up. That's what your experience section is. But in terms of your aspirational brand, you want to be focused. In fact, I'm going to give you one more quick example of this. Speaking of attorneys. Um, so years ago I was coaching an, an attorney and he, he, let's just say that he wanted to be a, become a recovering attorney. <laughs> and he, he said, again, didn't know what he wanted to be when he grew up, but we figured it out. He wanted to be a writer. Like, again, how do you turn an attorney into a writer? Well, what we did was, and this is it, this is, a, this is the exact, this is the answer to the question that you asked. So in his resume, we found all the different examples of his writing skills, which of course attorneys write a lot. And we highlighted that all throughout his, his, his resume. But then for LinkedIn, what we did was we said, okay, we branded him as a writer. And we took that about section and we said, here's why I'm shifting into writing. Here's my passion for writing. Here's my writing style, this so forth and so on. He ended up landing a job as a journalist for a legal trade publication. Now notice I just said journalist, right? So he was able to shift his lane, but he, would, he, but he kept the community because the legal pay trade publication said, great, you understand our community, but we're gonna pull you out, right? And, and allow you to, to shift your lane. So it was a minimize the risk for that employer. Here in the experience section, you've got, you have no choice but to list out your, your, your resume. However, however, here's, the, here's the, the, the nice thing about what you can do. And this is not, this is, Elizabeth is not the example for this because she's not a career changer, but here's what you can do. So, Remember I said with this guy with the, you know, how we pulled out his writing examples on his resume, all we did was we focused on every example of writing that he had ever done. Okay. We, we, we took away litigation. We took away all that other stuff that had nothing to do with his new brand. That's what you can do here in your experience section. <clears throat> While you can't change your, your title, you can't change the company that you work for. That's, that's static. What you can do is in this description section. Okay. Right here, right here, this description section. You can create bullets. I'm going to give you actually a place to find bullets because LinkedIn does not is not friendly toward Microsoft Office bullets. I'll give you a, a, in a second. I'll show you a place on web you can find LinkedIn friendly bullets. Anyway, you can create bullets right here. And what you do is in caps. Remember, you can't do bold or italics. In caps, you start to list out just like you did on your resume. You start listing out the different skill sets that you really want to aspire to. Okay, so in his case whatever the writing term was, we would have put that in caps, followed by an accomplishment and so forth and so on. So what happens is even though your title isn't different and your company can't change, you can, you can, you can, change, your, um, you can change your job description so that people, when they do read, if they read your description, it's something that's a lot more consistent with where you're going, okay? Now that said, there are some of you here um, who are, you've got a lot of different opportunities or at least a lot of different ways you think you may wanna go with your, with your career path. What I would highly recommend is, and this is going to sound counterintuitive, I, I realize that, be as, as, as specific as you can be, be as narrow, again, you can have some breath, but you want to be as narrow and as focused as possible, and here's why. Employers like to hire specialists, not generalists. If you are too open, if, you're, if, you are, if your brain is way too broad, almost the I can do anything thing, then you're not a specialist in anything. And that's not what people are looking for. They wanna know that you can solve their urgent problems. So you need to take the time, whether you partner with a friend, um, who by the way, if you do that, make sure it's somebody who's objective in your life, who doesn't have a dog in the hunt in terms of where your career paths to be. Or if you wanna partner with somebody like me on a formal basis, whatever, partner with somebody who can be objective for you and can really help you figure out community and lane and what's the broadly narrow brand you wanna have so that when you're writing your headline and your about section and your description, it all kind of lines up and it gives you a little bit of elasticity, but it still has some definition. Okay, so it's, it's really important that you that you know that. Okay, so I want to go back to some of these questions here and make sure that that I'm addressing them. And I want to I want to shift into the search the search features because that's really important. So right up here, there's a search bar. This is uh, what I call a hidden in plain sight tool. Uh, it's a golden tool, right at, <clears throat> right at your fingertips. 
you may not even be aware of. This search bar <clears throat> is the access to LinkedIn's very, very, very rich database. You have no idea how much information can be mined just from this little, this little guy here. <clears throat> and so I want to show you kind of technically how to use it, and then we'll go into, <clears throat> excuse me, then we'll go into some specifics. <clears throat> All right, so first of all, let's go back to that concept I mentioned, director of marketing, you're looking for your colleagues. So what I would do here is I would, I would start, I start playing around. <clears throat> I would do director of marketing. And, you can, and by the way, you can't break this thing, okay? So play around. You could do marketing leader, marketing professional, marketing VP, whatever, digital marketing. You can, you can be as narrow or specific as you want. But I want to show you just the concept here. So I typed in director of marketing. And you'll notice what comes up first is all of these different little filters. So the first thing you want to do if you're looking for people <clears throat> is you want to hit the people, people tab. So now, do you see it in the upper left-hand corner? How many directors of marketing came up for me? 9,570,000, a lot of people, <laughs> okay? Now, mind you, they're not all directors of marketing. Um, it's just that, that LinkedIn's algorithm, when, they, when you do a search for any, any term, <clears throat> what they're doing is they're first of all looking at the headline of the person that, 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 that has that term in their headline, and then they're kind of scanning down that person's page. So you'll see here, Austin, director of marketing, director of marketing, director of marketing. Now, by the time I get to page 10, it'll probably say something a little different, but right now, you have all these directors of marketing. Well, that's a lot of people. How, what do you want to do with that? <clears throat> a lot of things you can do with that. First thing that I want to share with you is this, this all filters button. Now, by the way, before I tap on this button, you will notice current company locations and connections are also found in the all filters. It's what I call the difference between shorthand and longhand division, okay? So all filters is your longhand division. It's got all the different filters you would need. But if you want the shortcut and you just want to filter by who your connections are, what the location is of those people or a current company that they happen to work at, you could use those. But for now, I just want to give you the, 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 the long way to do it. So in all filters, you're going to have all of these, these fields that are going to come up. And the first thing is your connections. I always recommend, always, always, always start by filtering down your first level contacts. Why? These are people either you know or you are acquainted, have, an, have an acquaintance with. You have some sort of connection with them. Those are the folks who you want to, or maybe you want to rekindle a relationship with them, but those are the folks who are more likely to help you. So if I were to do a first level, I would just want to see who exactly is in my network who's a director of marketing. Maybe they'd be open, if, if I know them well, more than likely they'll be open to a catch-up call. If I don't know them very well, <clears throat> maybe they'll be open to an informational meeting. Either which way, start with your first levels. Then I would do a separate, a separate search for your second levels. Because when you do your second levels, here's what's going to happen. See how Austin is a second level? See the, see the word second there? If I want to connect with, uh, with Austin, and when I say, I shouldn't say it that way. If I want to meet Austin, connecting with him just means a LinkedIn connection. And I can hit the connect button here and I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. But if I actually want to, you know, really meet him, I would open up Austin's profile and I'd go down here to the second section that says highlights. Under highlights, it says, in this case, it says seven mutual connections. Now, it's at least going to say one mutual connection. It could say 700, okay, but we happen to have seven. And I would open up those connections right here. And I'd say, all right, of this list of people who are all my first connections and their first levels to him as well, who among these people do I feel close enough to, if anybody, that I feel I could leverage that relationship? So if it's Jeff, right, I would say, I'd write to Jeff offline and I'd say, hi, Jeff, hope you're well. Noticed on LinkedIn, you're connected to, I'm sorry, Austin. Um, and now this has nothing to do with a specific job. It's just that you want to have a, a conversation with him. Um, I'm, you know, searching for a new opportunity in the da 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 field. Um, I was really impressed with, with Austin's profile. Sounds like we might have some synergies in common. Would you consider brokering an introduction so we can explore any, any mutual, mutual opportunities to help each other? That kind of a thing. Just a very sort of kind networking, mutual benefit sort of a thing. And there's a greater than, than, than you know, greater chance than not that Jeff will say, sure. And he just forwards your, um, you know, he forwards your profile to, to Austin and, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully connection happens. Now, stepping back for a second, um, going to, uh, going to the connect button. I, I want to show, I want to uh, show you a, a couple technical features with this. So let's say I want to connect with Austin directly. I don't want to go through Jeff. I'm just going to go straight in through the front door. 
So you see this connect button here? I want to I want to press pause and, and tell you about this little, this little guy. So LinkedIn um, ostensibly, they have always said that you're supposed to only connect with people that you know. Well, they don't really mean that. <laughs> They really want you to connect with as many people. I'm saying like they say one thing, but they but they act another way. They really want you to expand your network. And the reason is, and I and I actually am all for it, frankly, um, is that they realize that the more first level connections you have, the more second levels you're going to have, and the more third levels you're going to have, and you're going to get more benefit out of LinkedIn. So how do I know that they're not that that that, that they want you to connect um, broadly? Because there is another place here. And LinkedIn um, that you can you can actually very quickly expand your contacts and it's not actually right here in your in the in the profile it's right here in this this my network tab you clicked on my network and you go down here you scroll just a little bit oops here people you may know so I went to Maryland so people you may know from Maryland people you may know in similar roles right people you may know here there and wherever if I were to hit the connect button on this page what would happen is it would shoot out a very generic message. It wouldn't even give me, give me an opportunity to customize my, my invitation. It just makes it very, very easy. So what LinkedIn is inferring to me is like, well, we're okay, we're okay with you just sort of, you know, um, connecting with whomever because we really want to make it easy for you to make those connections. You will also see on your phone, if you, if you which I highly recommend that you have the LinkedIn app on your phone or your digital device, <clears throat> There's also a networking tab there too. And the same kind of thing, you could hit, like literally let your thumb do the walk-in, right? You could hit connect. I'm not suggesting that you do that necessarily, but you could, and it'll be very easy. However, however, if it's a meaningful connection, something you, somebody, somebody you really do wanna get to know. So like go back to Austin here. What I would do is this, and this is important, it's an important distinction. Get off of that My Network page, get off of it. Open up this person's profile. So on that My Network page, let me back up. On the My Network page, do you see how it says, hold on. Okay, so Theodore, right? If I hit the connect button here, yeah, it'll send out a generic note. But if I actually wanna do a customized note, what do I do? I click, watch here, I click on his name. Click on his name. Now his profile opens up. Now I can hit, I can hit the connect button. And by the way, I have to mention something else. This actually doesn't work on your phone. <laughs> On your phone, if you hit the connect button, even if it's on the profile, it will still send a generic message. What you'd have to do is you'd have to click on the on the three, there's like three little dots in the upper right hand corner of that person's page on your phone, and it'll say send a personalized invitation. But if you're on your PC, you hit the connect button here. Now you can add a note. So what would you write? You have 300 characters, that's not 300 words, 300 characters, to say something short, sweet, and compelling, right? Hi Theodore, I noticed your uh, you um, I noticed your your profile on LinkedIn. Very impressive. Looks like we have some uh, um, whatever in common. Or you know what you could say. Going back here because Theodore happens to be my second level, right? And I see that I've got my two mutual connections. Here's what I could do. And you have to notice the phraseology here. What I could say is, Hi Theodore, you and I are connected through. Paul Edelman on LinkedIn. And notice what I just said. You and I are connected through Paul. I did not say, which is not true. I did not say that Paul referred you to me. That's not true. Do not say that if it's not true. But you can say you and I are connected through um, uh, through Paul Edelman on LinkedIn. Perfectly legitimate. Um, you know, it looks like we might have some mutual synergies to explore. Would you be open to connecting here on LinkedIn and possibly setting up a Zoom coffee? Something like that. Right? And if it was a little bit more specific because you were applying for a job or you know, you're shifting careers or whatever the, 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 the reason is, put your reason here. Once, hopefully, hopefully, Theodore actually accepts your invitation, which by the way, a lot of people don't check their LinkedIn regularly, which means that invitation could be sitting there for weeks and months. Just understand that. What you want to do is if you really, really want to connect with Theodore at that point and he has not accepted your invitation, then again, go back. To your mutual connections and now tap Paul, okay? And write to Paul offline. Say, hey, Paul, looking to connect with Theodore. He may not have seen my LinkedIn invitation. Would you consider brokering an introduction? Okay, so a lot of ways you can kind of work around this and work with the tools, but I wanted to show that to you. The second thing I wanted to show is this idea of researching an employer. So here we go. I'm just going to put in American Red Cross, like I said I would. Now notice here, I'm going to show you the technique here. So I started typing American Red. Look what, look what just pulled up here. 
a whole bunch of opportunity, a whole bunch of, of options. What I want to do is I want the one with the um, with their logo. Okay, so I'm going to click on the American Red Cross with the company. Now their LinkedIn page just pulled up. This is not their website. This is their LinkedIn page. And you can see here where it says see, um, see 26,128 employees. You can click on that. Oh, before I, before I jump in there, here's the follow button. Somebody asked about following, okay? You can follow the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay here for just a second. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm bouncing around. <laughs> but here's where you can follow, right? You can, you can look at all the different tabs that they have, their overview, what their posts are, right? Um, if you want, you can, you can share it, you can comment. So if this is somebody asked about following, you, you would treat the organization like a person, right? Because the page kind of looks like a person. You follow them, you look at their posts, you comment on their posts, you can look at the jobs that are, that are here. You can, right, you just kind of go through anything. If you're really, really interested in them, you can go through all of these different tabs and kind of see what they're, what they're all about, all right? So that's, that's the following thing. But anyway, if you wanted to find out who was there, you would click on this employee section. Now, most employees, most organizations are not going to have 26,000 employees, so it's going to be a little, little more refined search. Um, but in any event, this is, this is what you would do. Now, what do you do from here? How do you find people? Well, there's a couple ways you can do it. You go back to the All Filters tab. Now, earlier, I shared with you that one of the All Filters is the first, second, and third levels. There are other things you can, there are other things you can do down here. You can search by location. And by the way, if you do not see the location here, you can always say Add Location. Because the thing with LinkedIn is that whenever they share with you anything in the filters, they're only pulling up the top, usually top five of the most common of whatever that filter is. <clears throat> so here, yeah, DC's here, but let's say it wasn't here. Let's say pretend it wasn't here. I would just start typing in Washington and then now that it pulls up. By the way, uh, within the last couple of years, LinkedIn decided to merge our two regions together, DC and Baltimore. Now we all know these regions have nothing to do with each other, but in Seattle, they don't know that they have combined us officially. So you will always say DC Baltimore now. Okay. And then, uh, and then you, then you, you know, right here, it's all the current company is already checked off because you're doing a search for the Red Cross. So they've already checked that off for you. You don't need schools. Now industry, um, you don't, in this case, you wouldn't necessarily need to check the industry box, but I'm going to I'm going to press pause here for a second. Let's pretend for a second we weren't doing a, a company search right now. Let's just say we were searching for people in your lane. Okay, so project managers or operations executives or whatever it is, the kind of person. What you can do here is you can, if you have like thousands and thousands of people you're trying to filter down, you can use the industry button. Now, industry is interesting. Whenever you create your LinkedIn profile, LinkedIn requires you to list an industry. But some of you don't have an industry. Some of you don't have a community. You're just a lane person, right? But they still force you to do it. So you have to use a little bit of kind of detective work to think about walk a mile in the shoes of the person that, that you're looking at, that you're trying to find. How might they think of themselves? So for example, and this is that recruiters have to think about this all the time. So I'm gonna put my recruiter hat on now. And uh, so right now I'm doing a search for an executive director for a, uh, for a national um, association, it's a medical society, okay? So I know that I'm looking for people who are, um, you know, who are executives, who are association executives. I'm also looking for people who are in the medical society world, which is, doesn't mean a medical organization, it just means an association whose members are in the medical profession. So I happen to know because I, I, I know these folks, I know that 99 times out of 100, if I'm looking for an association executive, you know how, what industry they're gonna use? The one right here, nonprofit organization management. There is no such, there is no association industry, there's just nonprofit. But let's say I didn't know all of the possible industries that LinkedIn has to see if you, you can add an industry, well, what do you put in there? LinkedIn has some very defined industries. They've got like 30 of them or something. Here's where you find it. You go to your homepage, okay? You're either you can hit the home button or you can hit the in button. It's the exact same thing. Hit your home page. Now, this is my home page, my LinkedIn home page. I would click on my on my picture. That's step one. Now it's going to take me to what's called the editable page. Editable meaning you're going to see these little pencils all the way down the page where you can edit your profile. So I'm going to look at the one right here in the upper right. Click on that. I'm going to scroll down a little bit right here see where it says industry tap on 
drop, drop down there and all of a sudden you see all of LinkedIn's industries. Okay, so take a look at that offline <clears throat> and try to think about, well, okay, if I'm looking for this kind of person, whoever it is, intuitively, what might be the different kinds of industries that they might ascribe themselves to? So as you look down here, what you'll notice <clears throat> is that, yeah, LinkedIn calls these things industries, but there are a few of them that actually double as a link, double as a profession. So one of them, for example, is marketing. So here we go. See, marketing and advertising. LinkedIn thinks of this as a marketing and advertising agency. But actually, marketing and advertising people will use this as their industry, but it's really their profession. I happen to know that, right? So when I'm looking for a marketing person, I, and I'm looking for a marketing person, person in an association, I'll do two different searches. I'll do one with the industry that's nonprofit and one for the industry that is marketing and advertising because I know that they might be interchangeable. Okay, so you've got to be thinking about this very creatively so that you can find the, find the right people, okay? Okay, so let's get out of there for a second. Okay, all right, I wanna go back to these questions because I wanna make sure that we are addressing everything here. Um, oh, let's, 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 let's shift for, for a quick second um, to what I'll call, we'll look at the settings section for a second because this is where we're gonna talk about LinkedIn Premium, we'll talk about looking at profiles anonymously, um, you know, that, that whole thing. So let's, let's shift over. Up, up here in the upper right hand corner is a tiny little button that says me. There's a little picture of yourself. I'm gonna drop down there and you're gonna go into settings and privacy. Now there is way too much information here for me to, to do, to go through in a training, but I did wanna mention a couple of things. So you have here account preferences, sign in security, all of these different tabs. If you look at visibility, okay. So visibility, there's a lot of different sections you can go in here, but the, one of the ones I wanted to mention is the one right at the top and it's called profile viewing options. So this lets people, this is where you can change um, how visible you are. So if you want to do a search, like I was just, any of the searches I just mentioned, and you wanna be anonymous, meaning you don't want, like uh, I looked at Austin's profile, okay? So if I don't, want it, I don't want Austin to know that I'm like stalking him on LinkedIn, which is a perfectly acceptable thing to do, but <laughs> there was just no need for him to know that. I would click here. Now I've already made myself anonymous because I do lots of trainings and recruiting and I just, there's really no need for people to know that I'm looking at them. So normally though, this is what's clicked, okay? Normally, like right now, if you were to go into your settings and privacy, it would be your name, your title would be visible to anybody that you're doing, that you're, that you're searching for. However, you could make the decision to go anonymous, but let me tell you the pro and con of that. The pro of course is, hey, it gives you full freedom. You can look at anybody at any time, nobody, nobody's to the wiser. Here's the con though, okay? If you are an active job seeker, which I have to believe all of you are, and you are trying to um, make a meaningful connection with someone, it's not a bad idea for that person to know that you've, if you will, winked at them, okay? That's not a bad thing at all. If anything, I, you wanna be err more on the side of doing an open search, not an anonymous search, because what, here's what's happened. If you look at somebody, what might they do? They might look at you back. Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that good for them to go ahead and look at your profile? You're looking at theirs, you're doing it by intention. It'd be really nice for them to look at yours and say, oh, Kate, wow, never heard of her before. What's she all about? Who knows? They could be reached out, okay? Um, so that's just something for you to consider. And by the way, you can, you can turn this on and off anytime you want. So if you wanna do certain searches where you're not anonymous, and certain searches where you are, it's flexible, go back and forth as much as you want. Now let me address LinkedIn Premium for a second while we're kind of on this general topic. So LinkedIn, look, they're a business and they gotta make money. Good on them, right? They gotta make money. But they offer so many things to us for free. They, everything that I have just shared with you is free. And there's a minor exception, and I'm gonna tell you about that in a second, but everything's free. But of course, they would love to get your money, right? So they offer these premium packages. And one of the ways that they kind of entice you into taking premium is what I call an itch scratching concept. What in the world does that mean? Itch scratching, meaning we are in this sort of social media world right now where it's, ooh, I want to see who looked at me. I want to see if people like me. Okay. So what they do is they entice you by saying, hey, 
we're going to offer you premium. And for premium, you're going to get to see who's looked at you. Now, of course, the, presuming it's not anonymous, okay? If you don't have premium, you can't see that feature. But to me, it is not worth it to pay 50, 60, whatever it bucks a month just for the privilege of having to see who's looked at you. Because here's the thing of it, just because they've looked at you doesn't mean they're going to do anything with your profile. If they've looked at you and they want to connect with you, they're going to connect with you whether or not you know it. So knowing it is not going to add to your life any, at all. It might, again, scratch an itch, but that's not going to really help you much. That said, there is one reason and one reason only that I believe, and I believe uh, Elise agrees with me on this because we've had this training before, um, that you should consider LinkedIn. And that's as follows. If you are going to do a lot of searching, you're going to actually have to at some point, sign up for LinkedIn for LinkedIn Premium, and here's why. If you do a ton of searching, I, and I, I don't know how, at what point that it, you'll, you'll, you'll get to this boundary, but you'll, it'll, hit, it'll hit at some point, where you're searching and searching and searching and searching, and one day, out of the blue, there's this little box that's going to come up on your page, and it's going to say something to the effect of, you have exceeded your commercial limit in, on LinkedIn, and you must now upgrade to Premium. Like, commercial limit? What are you talking about? Commercial limit <laughs> basically means this. LinkedIn now thinks you're a recruiter or a salesperson because recruiters and salespeople are typically the only people who use the search features that robustly. You just, as a job seeker, are learning how to be your own recruiter. So you're, give, being, you're being given inside tips. But as far as LinkedIn is concerned, hey, guy, hey, you got, you got to pay up. And that's fine. That is completely their prerogative. They should be doing that. But, but, but don't do it now. Wait. If you're going to use search features a lot and you get to that point, Absolutely. That means you've really, you know, you, it's worth it for you because you're using it extensively. Okay. So let me go back to the questions. Um, oh, dates, ageism, all of that. So let's go back to the profiles. Um, so here's the thing with, with, with ageism and LinkedIn versus resumes and, and so forth. Ageism, as, ageism is real. We all know that. Um, and I'm going to give you a resume tip, and then I'm going to give you the LinkedIn version of that. Okay, um, and you'll and you'll hear you'll hear slightly different variations depending on who you talk to. My personal opinion with your resume is you only go back about 20 years, 15 to 20 years. Um, on your resume, if you need absolutely need to mention to employers that you have more working experience, because for some reason there's something about your past experience prior to 20 years that's very germane to your uh, to your, um, your search. So for example, I was once coaching a communications executive and in her particular case, it was really important for her to, to, to know, uh, excuse me, it was really important for her to let employers know that she started as a journalist. It was like a really interesting part of her narrative. She went a Pulitzer Award, it was this whole thing, right? So for her, okay, it made sense. But what we did on the resume is we had this section at the bottom called prior experience, prior experience, and all it did was list company title, company title, no dates. Okay, so it does show more than 20 years, but doesn't exactly say how many. If you can avoid prior experience, do. But if you really feel you need to do it, do it. On LinkedIn, a little different. Here's the thing with LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn requires you to put in the dates of your employment. But let me put a little caveat to that. They do not require you, you to put in the dates of your education big distinction. Okay. You do have to put dates of employment. You do not have to put dates of education. Therefore, similar to your resume, go back the 20 years. If you have more experience, sorry, Charlie, you can't put it on there. Or if you do, you're going to have to put the dates. Okay. So you have to make a decision. How far back do you want to go? Where do you want to cut it off? Because you do you have to put dates. Education. Yay. You don't have to. Okay. And in fact, I'm going to show you real quickly how that looks. So again, you want to go to your editable page. You're going to scroll down here. Okay. So let's say you need to, in, this is your experience section. Let's say you need to add um, an, an employment, change it. You're going to hit the plus sign. You're going to go down here. Now it does say dates. So if I'm, I'm going to say I'm not currently working in this role. And you don't have to put months, by the way. You can just do year, you know, X to Y. And you hit save and, you know, you fill out your description. You just, you know, fill, fill it out properly. Hit save and, and your, your new experience will come up. But in the education, I finally recently took off my own dates because I finally hit, hit, that, hit that certain age. Um, what you would do is you would hit the, hit the pencil. Okay. So you can see you don't have to. It's here if you wanted to. 
but you don't, it's not a required field. Okay. So I was able to eliminate my, my education, my education dates. Okay. Going back to the, um, somebody mentioned something about job alerts that are not in your geographic location. So I don't know if I can address that specifically here. Here's what I would generically say about the job alerts. What, what I think this person was talking about is the fact that in LinkedIn, LinkedIn has a jobs board. Now this is not really part of my training only because LinkedIn's job board is very similar to everybody else's job board. And it's right here. Here's the jobs button. And you can set up alerts. So, you know, here, see my jobs and job alerts. You can, I'm not gonna really, it, this is so easy. For, you just go offline, just go here, go in here and, and play around with it. Um, but, but the point is that this is a separate feature of LinkedIn. It's its own job board. Again, just like Indeed, just like Career Builder, just like any job board you would ever be on. And the fact is this, LinkedIn, they don't get paid by you. They get paid by the employer for the job board. It is in their best interest to send you as many possible oper job opportunities as possible. Why? Because they're trying to get candidates for the employer. So it's really hard to get them to be too, too filtered. I mean, you can filter it to some extent. They're not going to, you know, if you're a project manager, they're not going to send you a marketing job, obviously. And yet they're going to expand their, their breath a little bit, you know, geography or this and that, different titles. They may seem completely irrelevant to you, but that's not a LinkedIn's concern. They just, just want to make sure that they're getting in front of you for the possibility that you might think that this is a good job. So really delete button. I mean, that's really what I can tell you. Okay. So not, not too much you can do to, to change all of that. All right. So going back to questions, uh, actually, I think we have, okay. I think we have actually addressed a lot of what's here. Um, I want, there's a couple of other things I want to talk to you about, uh, before we go into whatever's in the chat box. I want to talk about recommendations. Okay. Oh, oh, before I do that, sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. Um, I do want to share with you a link. So I'm going to put this in the chat box. Okay, so this page, okay, this is another uh, woman who, like me, she also does LinkedIn profiles. And she has been very kind years ago. She put on this page of her website, LinkedIn friendly bullets. See those right here? These little bullets? Okay. All you have to do is copy and paste in any section of your, of your profile. It could be in your headline. It could be in your about section. It could be in your experience. Personally, I mean, do whatever you like. Personally, I happen to like this little diamond right here. I happen to like this little star. I happen to like this little arrow and I happen to like this little checkbox. That's just me, okay? And in fact, if you, can, if you see on my, on my profile, do you see how I actually included these little diamonds? Now I have a lot of a lot of practice areas, so that made sense for me. I put these little diamonds in here, okay? And you can also put it in throughout uh, from in my LinkedIn. I use the little I use the little um, arrow here, and I use the little diamonds here. Whatever you want, but I just wanted you to know that it's there. So let me go ahead and put that in chat, so you have it. Hold on. Oops, sorry. Chat. And okay, so that's that's the the link. But I wanted to talk about recommendations. So recommendations, first of all, are different than what's called endorsements. Okay, so LinkedIn has this section called endorsements. I think I took mine off because I meant to. Oh, I didn't. Okay. Well, anyway, this thing called skills and endorsements. Skills and endorsements started a number of years ago, and <laughs> the fact of the matter is, it doesn't really say too much about your skills because what it is is just skills that other people in your network were prompted about meaning it, it said um so so let's say um you know let's say amy you and i are first level connected uh linkedin might randomly uh, throw, you know toss up a little box and say um how, you know um what's your skill in? and they'll, they'll prompt you they will think of the term they'll say what how good is shira at you know temporary staffing now if you didn't know any better you'd click I don't know, maybe you just want to say, oh, she's good at it. Well, first of all, I don't do temporary staffing. And I say that because there are a lot of skills that you're going to be endorsed for that you don't even do. Happens to me all the time. Okay. Why? Because in LinkedIn land, they look at your profession and they assume certain skills. So people are going to endorse you for things you have no, you, you, you don't even do. Endorsements are not a bad thing, but they're not anything that you want to pay a whole lot of attention to. It has been said, and I think Elise confirmed this in the last time we talked, that it supposedly, you know, the more the more endorsements you have for a particular skill, potentially 
LinkedIn's algorithm will look at that and kind of bring you up, um, uh, you know, to bring you up higher on a page when someone's doing a search for you. That is certainly potential. But to me, if you're going to spend any time on, on your profile, it's going to be on your re recommendation section. So here's the recommendation section. First of all, you can't have too many. Let me just start with that. Get as many as you can. Number two, you want recommendations from people, and I'm going to presume that if you, if you are a, a W-2 employee, a regular traditional employee. Number one, you want them from supervisors. Absolutely, if, if at all possible, as far back as you can get, just get supervisors. Next would be colleagues, direct reports, vendors, anybody who's worked with you. Not a friend, not a family member, not someone who just likes you. Right? In fact, I've had people, I've had my own clients ask me to recommend them. And there's, I mean, I love them, but I've never worked with them. I've, I've coached them. I've written their resumes, but I've never worked with them. So I, I couldn't in, in good, good conscience actually write a recommendation. You've got to get somebody who really knows your work. That's the second thing. The third thing, and this is very important. You don't just want any recommendation. You want a recommendation that speaks to your brand. Because I have seen it happen where people recommend people for things and they, it's a lovely glowing recommendation, but it's actually counter to the brand that they're looking for. Let me give you an example. Maybe just maybe the person who you, you, you get a recommendation from, if you don't guide them otherwise, maybe they say, oh my gosh, Amy, man, is she just the most organized and detailed and structured person I have ever had the pleasure of working with. But maybe Amy's brand is that she's a creative thinker, strategic thinker, out of the box, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, she might be structured and organized, but this, that's not the fact that what she wants to be focused on. She wants to be focused on this known for this other thing. So what I would recommend is that you, when you reach out, and I'll, I'll technically show you how to do this in a second, but when you reach out to your recommender, potential recommender, point them to your fancy new about section, okay? <laughs> Take the time to write that compelling about section, draw them there. And even if you haven't done that, done that yet, you can still guide them. You can still say, hey, Kate, who's my potential recommender, um, you know, hope you're doing well. I'm looking to top grade my LinkedIn profile. I'm hoping that, hoping that you would consider writing a recommendation for me. If so, would you consider focusing on X, Y, or Z? certain skill sets, my industry experience, this or that, whatever you want them to focus on, guide them. Because otherwise they're not going to know. They're just going to write whatever comes to top of mind. So here's the technical side of it. So first thing is, again, email them. Just write them an email. Or look, if they're, if they're close enough contact, you're probably on, you know, probably on texting basis with them, call them, whatever. You know, just connect with them personally. Don't just do this through LinkedIn. Actually just call them. And you would ask them, write this thing. And they'll say, oh, sure, Kate, happy to help you. Da, da, da. Fine. Now, at the end, when they say, yes, they're willing to do it, now you want to make life easy for them and you want to send them a recommendation request through the LinkedIn portal. They could do it proactively, but you don't want to give, make them think about that. You want to do this proactively. So there's two places you can find this. Number one, if you already have recommendations, like I do, you can click on this Ask for Recommendation button. Okay, so I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it this way, and then I'm going to show you the other way that you can access this. So you can ask for a recommendation, and it'll say, who do you want to ask? So right now, Elise has come to mind, because I know that, oops, <laughs> Elise, watch that, I forgot the two S's. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to click on Elise, um, the, select the relationship, and it's going to give you a whole bunch of ones, I'm just randomly picking one. Select your position at the time, pick whatever it is, and then hit next. Now here, <clears throat> you see how it says, hi, Elise. And by, you notice this interesting here? Because Elise has doctor and she happens to have a middle initial, LinkedIn did, hi, Dr. Elise W. Well, that's, of course, not how you would write to Elise anyway. So no matter what, you would have to, you know, take this here, right? Take this down. But, but even so, notice how LinkedIn's generic request is, hey, Elise, could you write me a recommendation? Well, that's clearly not the most professional thing, and it's not the most customized thing in the world. That's why you start with the um, you start with the email or the phone call. Once that person agrees, now you go back here and you say, "Hi, Elise. <clears throat> Thanks for agreeing to write me a LinkedIn recommendation, right? So forth and so on." 
And um, as we discussed, you know, you're, you're going to be focused or just a gentle reminder, please focus on X skill, Y skill, my brand, blah, blah, blah. Okay. That's, that's how you want to use this section. Then you hit send. They'll get it. So Elise will get it. She'll write it. It'll come back to you. You could actually ask for an edit. There's a button there. To, you know, there's a, something you want her to change and she can go ahead and edit it. And then you'd hit publish. And once you hit publish, okay, then it'll show up here in your recommendations. But, but understand it will show up in the order it was received. So Kimberly was the most recent recommendation I got. And then I, I have to go all the way down, you know, and then so forth and so on. Okay. So the most recent one I got was from Kimberly. Make sense? Okay. Whew. All right. So we're actually doing pretty good on time. So I'm going to stop sharing right now and I'm going to ask for questions. So uh, actually before we go, we, before we go hand raise, I know that there were some people in the chat box. I want to be respectful of the order of, of questions. So Elise, did you want to um, share with me the chat box questions? And then we can go to the live questions. Okay. Uh, chat box. What what about adding the dates of current education, i.e. a certificate earned within the last two to three years? 100%. Definitely do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the thing, the thing with education is it's flexible. It's not like you have to add or like add, add, add dates for everything or not. You can literally pick and choose. So, for example, uh, you want to, <clears throat> sorry, let's go back here. Okay, so I should I should share something with you. <clears throat> so there is there is education, sort of the, what I call the, the traditional traditional education. But if you go back up here, I'm sorry, if you go all the way back up here. Um, see where it says add profile section. Okay, this is you're again you're on your page, your editable page. It'll say add profile section. So there's other things here you can have like licenses and certifications. That's different than education. Education is usually college education. Licenses and certification is different, and you can put in what the name of you know, the, the name of the certification, the issuing organization, the years, all that stuff if you want. And I highly would recommend I would highly recommend that, especially if it's recent, and especially if you are trying to career shift and you're trying to upskill yourself. And you want to people people know, hey, look, I got my certification in this technology or whatever. Great, yes, please please do put the dates so that it's, so people can see that it's recent. Okay, next question. Okay. Is I've gotten a message to try premium for a one month free trial. Um, I don't, because you only get, because the clock starts ticking, I wouldn't use it yet. Wait, wait. If you, because as I mentioned, the only, to me, the only real value of having the LinkedIn is the ability to do the extended search. That itch scratching thing isn't really gonna help you anyway. So what I would do is I'd wait. Wait until you've done a whole bunch of searches you get that little box that says you've exceeded your commercial limit, then turn on the 30 day trial. And now with you, you basically extended yourself for 30 days. I just don't feel like it's worth it otherwise. The other thing to uh, keep in mind with that is even once you've done the 30 day trial and you cancel it, they will send you another message saying, oh, you can get a 30 day trial. But if you do that within 13 months, you are now going to pay for it. It's not free anymore. You can only get the free trial after a year has passed since you did the last free trial. Right. Right. So, so use it judiciously is the point. Yeah. Okay. Next and like Shira, I don't recommend it unless you start bumping up against the commercial uh, search limits. Otherwise, it's, it's not worth it because worth most it. of you are not doing what you can do for free. Right. Yeah. Just do all, exhaust everything you can do for free before you even think about doing premium. Next question, Lisa. Um, that is really all uh, that's in the, oh, wait a minute. Uh, any tips it, it advice or content for the volunteering section? I'm sorry, the question was, what should you put in for volunteering? Any tips or advice Which, on content for the volunteer? Great, the, uh, thank section. you for that. Uh, let, me, let me talk about volunteering for, for a, a nanosecond here. It's a great, great question. So on the one hand, LinkedIn does have a section, see, called volunteering. Hold on, pull it up, please. Okay, volunteer experience. And you could, right, you put in, right, whatever your volunteering is. And, and in your description, you would put down sort of what, what you did. And look, depending upon how related that work is to your work, you have a decision to make here. And here's why. 
some of you on this call have, are in transition, right? So you, you were, you're not employed at the moment and you're looking for ways to, to, um, to kind of fill in the gap between the last time you had a full-time job and now. What you could, you could do if you wanted to, and this is especially the case if your current volunteer work is related at all to your actual profession, here's what I would do. I wouldn't put the volunteer work in this section. What I would do, hold on, what I would do is <clears throat> I would add it to your experience right at the top. And here's what I would do. And you'd be very you know, appropriate about this, but you would say, um, you know, whatever, whatever the title is, you know, that volunteer role and treat it like a job. However, in the, um, in the, um, in the description section, right, right here, you would start out by saying in this volunteer role, da, 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 da. okay. So you're very clear about the fact that you're not misrepresenting anything. It is absolutely a volunteer role, but it is something you've been doing for however long. And you're only putting it there because it's related now. If it's not related to your, to your, um, to your career, you have a decision to make. Because here's the thing: on the it's, 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 it's a dichotomy. On the one hand, employers like to know that you've been occupied since your since your last position. So it actually is good to have something there. On the other hand, if the thing that you're doing, whether it's volunteer or maybe it's a, a you know something that's completely unrelated, like a retail job or whatever. On the other hand, if it's completely unrelated, ugh, it could cause a little bit of confusion. So you know, I'd have to advise you on a case by case basis, but just understand there is a kind of a pro and a con to it. But again, re regarding volunteering, if it's related, create, an, create a, 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 a regular experience thing if you're in transition. If you're not, I would go ahead and do, um, uh, you know, put in the volunteers. Uh, Phil? And could you put some in volunteer and some in the experience? Absolutely, yep. Okay, great. Yeah, fine, totally fine. Could you talk about recommendations in the case of your experience as a non-W-2 employee? Yeah, actually, th that's a great question. Do it. And same thing with volunteer, because here's the thing, whether you, whether you get money for it or not, it's still work, okay? In fact, I have a, 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 a charitable organization that I run on the side called BoomerWorks, which by the way, PS, it's completely free. If any of you on this call are interested in, in exploring self-employment, hook up with us. It's boomerworks.org. This is our, our website, boomerworks.org. We have free training. We, um, every, twice, twice a month, uh, we offer an educational program followed by a, uh, what's called a growth group. In fact, we have one coming up on Thursday where it's peer networking. We have a training center here, uh, which, which, which has videos of all kinds of aspects of self-employment. Um, so I only mention that because <laughs> um, on, your, on my LinkedIn profile, right, I actually have that as one of my you know, as one of my volunteering, but I also had somebody, one or two people who actually recommended me because of the volunteer work that they did with me. Okay. So, so to that, to, to your question, um, if you want to have, um, in fact, I think it was, hold on a second. if you want to have somebody recommend you, so there's, here's, so here's my volunteering, right. And then down here, Holly, right? She worked with me on, um, you know, on that as well. Okay. So yeah, so that hopefully that answers your question. Other questions? That's all the questions in the chat. All right. Any other live questions? Um, well, I, I think I know what to do, but I was, uh, I put in the question about the non W2, but I wasn't thinking about volunteering. I was thinking about, um, I've worked, I have worked for myself um, for a very, very, very long time. Um, and, you know, so I'm just thinking of colleagues, various people who have been parts of teams with me and there's nothing quite like a supervisor, but as a lawyer, I have a couple of judges that I, that would write me a recommendation. So, so let me answer your question by actually making this personal. So as you can see, I'm in business for myself. Look at all the people that have recommended me, clients. They could have been colleagues. They could, the, the fact that work is work is work is work. Right. It's work. Right. Self-employed, W-2, volunteer, whatever. If somebody has worked with you closely, teammate, client, supervisor, direct report, vendor, tick off fingers and toes, 
they are worthy of, be, of being asked to write your recommendation, period. End. Just not a family member, friend, you know what I mean? If they, if they haven't worked with you, then no. But if they have worked with you, all, all, all is fair game. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the other thing about that is, um, it, she was talking about family. One of the first recommendations I got was a family member who said, you know, any company would be lucky to have Elise as an employee. Well, you can you cannot change the order of your, your recommendations. So the last one in will be the first one, but you can hide them. Yes. So if there's one that just isn't relevant, it's it's off message or it just doesn't help, then you can hide it and it no longer appears. It's still there, but it's hidden. They can't see it. Right. Exactly. So you can show and hide, but you can't reorder them. The last yeah. one in becomes the first one exactly. in your section. Yeah, exactly. In fact, can I ask a question? In fact, by the, yeah. by, by, by the way, I'm sorry, before you ask the question. So notice just to show you what, what Elise is talking about, if you did want to ever hide it, what you would do is you'd go to recommendations, you'd go to this pencil. And in this case, so here, right here, all of them, you would just hit, you would click hide. Hmm. Okay. Good. All right, sorry, is that the question? Okay, I was just wondering, uh, actually I have two questions. I actually um, saw you back in November for the expo, and then I, I went online on YouTube and I saw one of your hour presentations, which was very dark and you couldn't see the screen and whatnot. I appreciate that you're gonna be sending us this PowerPoint. I'm assuming it's going to also be the total narration as well, correct? Uh, only if you guys are, are, uh, are recording this. Are you, rec are you are recording this? Yeah, yes. they are. They are. So it, this would be so this would be basically what you would get from from JCA would be, the, would be this recording. OK. And then is there also a time limit on being, you know, being able to access it? It shouldn't be. Um, Elise and Jody. You mean would, this, this video? Yeah. yeah. Yes. They only stay up until the next class. What? Like next month? We only have we only have so much space. Right. Um, I, understand. So, I understand. So my question then would be to Shira, do you, have you updated your YouTube? Because that last one was pretty bad. No offense. I couldn't see the, the you know, the screen. So you're talking, oh, I see. Cause that was, that was the one I did live. It was, it was right, actually right before COVID. <laughs> it was my last live presentation. Uh, right. Yeah. So I have not done another one of these um, recorded. Okay. What I could do is um, Elise, if we can maybe connect offline. If I can get a copy of this recording, I can, mm -hmm. I can work offline with somebody to have them slice up my portion Perfect. and then I can, I can, then I can just repurpose right. it. So, uh, Leah, it's a great question because I've actually thought that myself, I'm like, oh yeah, I really should record this. And I just you, did it because they do. You're, you're trying to write and watch and it's right. really hard. So then my other question is, um, I'm, I'm a career shifter, okay? And I was once, I, like a few years ago, I was an activist. And I, and that is all about communication. And, but it was like going up against, you know, one of the industries that run this country, which is the uh, oil and natural gas industries. And I don't know if you should put something like that in, is it a, is it a you know, mark against me to, to put activism in? Well, let's put it this way. It would have everything to, do, I mean, this may sound almost obvious, but it would have everything to do with the brand that you were trying to create right now. Um, so look, if you are trying to be seen as um, very uh, passionate about the environment right. and you're on a particular side of the aisle, if you will, go right. for it. Okay. If, however, that is something you want to pull back on, you're going to actually have to start retracting and, mm -hmm. and, and sanitizing your power. Right. That completely has to do with where you're going right now. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Michael. Uh, yeah, the one question I've had, it's been one that I've had since the beginning and things like that. And I'm, I've asked a lot of people this, but if you've been out of work for a while, mm -hmm. for medical reasons or something like that, mm -hmm. and you're trying to maybe go into a different career path or something like that, how do you address the time off and everything? If somebody's going to look at that and go, well, he hasn't worked for X amount of years. Well, how can that, he well actually, you, you, so what you would do is you wouldn't say, well, okay. <laughs> So it depends on what the, what the reason is, but here's what the generally what I would say, overcome it, like address it. And what you would do is in your LinkedIn, you can do this on your resume as well. The section would say personal sabbatical, personal sabbatical. 
And then in your description section, you would be very brief about it. Please do not indicate that you had, a, if, it, if it was you personally, that it was a medical situation, because that could trigger all kinds of discrimination issues. We don't want that at all, okay? But you can simply say something to the effect of, you know, it took, um, you know, period, the, the, this period from this year to this year to, to, um, to handle a personal situation. You could even say a family, um, a family medical situation. That's fine because you are your own family. That's fine. As long as it's family oriented or just personal. And then you can say, and as of X date, uh, ready to return to the work, re ready to return to the workforce and now seeking opportunities in the blah, blah, you know, career. So personal sabbatical, sanitize it, use the word personal, use the word family, quick, address it and move on. Because people just want to know that you're, they're overcoming the time that you were, the gap that you had. If you don't say anything, it makes them scratch the head. Well, what's he doing? Right? Just, I'd say it, but just be very, you know, kind of short about it. Okay. Um, how important is the all-star ranking? Um, if it is, what do I need to do to get there? Okay, Lisa, you and I, we've never talked about this one. I don't think it's important at all. I think that's just kind of a LinkedIn gimmick to say, hey, you're an all-star. I don't, I don't see any real benefit. Lisa, you might have a different opinion. It's usually just a measure of the completeness of your profile. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and as you fill in sections and add um, connections, you'll get there. Exactly. And it's a pretty low bar, frankly. Yeah. Right. Um, I've had people go from beginner, novice, starting off in a class that I've done. And by the end of it, they're an all-star. Yeah, um, I mean, it's like- so it's a very low trigger. Yeah, low so bar. it's really, you know, how you have your picture and your headline and your about section and your experience section and maybe some recommendations or whatever, and like you're there. I mean, so it's, it, to Lisa's point, it's not a big deal, but as far as achieving it, like, oh, it's not, it's not about the thing. They're just trying to get you, they're trying to encourage you to have a full profile. And that is to your benefit to have a complete profile. You definitely get more opportunities shown to you by LinkedIn by having a complete profile. Um, you know, it gives you more space to enter keywords by completing all the sections of your profile. Again, for uh, those of us who are older, um, it sends a bad message that maybe you're not tech savvy if you don't have a complete profile. So there are all kinds of benefits of having a complete profile and, and getting to all-star just happens to be one of them. And but the more filled out it is. Why you want a complete yeah. profile. Yeah, fill it out. Again, compelling about section, experience section, make sure that it's rich, right? It'll really, it'll show, yes, yeah, so it'll show your tech savviness. It'll showcase your brand. I mean, there's all kinds of, helps people find you. It helps to break the keywords. I mean, there's just so many reasons why to do it, do it. <laughs> all right, so with that, I think we're kind of at time here. Hopefully this was helpful to you.